Colleen Conlin is an entrepreneur who specializes in helping women overcome limiting beliefs by mastering kettlebells. Her fitness advice has been featured in New York Post, Women's Health, Cosmopolitan, and more. An eating disorder survivor, Colleen owes much of what has helped her overcome adversity in her life to learning the hard style kettlebell technique. Please welcome to the show, Colleen Conlin. There Hi. she is. Hi, Colleen. I'm so excited to meet you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to meet you. I'm Alex. I'm Tina. I know. (laughs) Um, I I love that you're already set up and ready to go. I love this whole setup. I I wanted to, I saw you guys had your mics and your your earbuds and I was like, you know what? Maybe I should, maybe I should do that too. You nailed it. So Colleen, in our research for this interview, we realized we, the three of us have something in common, which is we all went to school for musical theater. I know. I found that out too. I was like, no way. So yes. where did you go? So I went to cap 21 after they split from NYU. So I was in like, yes. they had a couple of like weird classes that technically were just like its own thing. So I was with mm-hmm. them before they then became affiliated with Malloy. Yes. I remember this switch and this is so funny. So I went to the heart school in Connecticut, but when I moved here, I worked with some people from NYU and like half my friends went to Steinhardt. My husband went to NYU. I have so many NYU people just in my orbit. That's so funny. It's a small world. Oh God, it really is. And are you still in New York? Are you based in New York now? No, me and my husband moved out during the pandemic to Arizona. So I am in sunny Arizona. That sounds lovely. We have our very own specific thoughts about our musical theater programs. It can really be a pressure cooker. And there's so many things. I mean, personally, I feel like I had to spend years unlearning things I learned in college. What are some of your takeaways and what was your college experience like in such a prestigious program? I mean, and you were also in the thick of it in New York City. I was at least a little removed. Like I was Mm -hmm. in Connecticut. It was so incredible, but so stressful at the same time. It was so incredible because, you know, I grew up listening to all of these original Broadway cast recordings. And then like Carrie Butler is, you know, walking out of the elevator as I'm going into the studio to start some class. It was just, it was incredible in that sense. I had wonderful teachers, but I really hated myself during this time because I felt so much pressure to be number one I felt so much pressure to stand out. I mean, my class, I think there were about 10 girls and eight of us were brunettes. And I was just trying to figure out like, how do I stand out? I remember I bleached my hair after the first semester. It lasted two days and I was like, I can't do this. I'm just going to have to like be the brunette that stands out. It was kind of miserable in a sense, just trying to do everything possible to stand out. And that's actually one of the reasons why I left the musical theater industry, because it was just something that I I personally couldn't handle. Right. That game of how do you make yourself different, but Mm -hmm. also how do you do a performance that's the same as someone else and also fit into that costume and also fit into that track? It's a constant game of be an individual, but also fit into this tiny box. Okay. So you left the musical theater industry. Had, Had you already found the kettleball? Bell. No, it's, it's no. Kettle bell. It's kettlebell, right? I'm, I'm okay. Don't mind the <laughs> kettlebell. What is you know, wrong with me? A oh lot my God. Of people, a lot of people I've heard say kettlebell. It's technically kettlebell. Oh my but God. All good. Um, I've used a kettlebell. I love a kettlebell. I am fine. <laughs> um, no, actually. So I remember walking, walking back to my apartment one night after class and I walked by a Barry's boot camp. And I saw all of these like red lights and I was like, oh my gosh, what are they doing in there? And I never went into Barry's boot camp, but that's what got me into Soul Cycle, And that's what got me started in the fitness industry. I was in the fitness industry for about five years before I even found out about kettlebells. And I found out about them by accident because I was just bullshitting my way into a a new role within the fitness industry. I was a group fitness instructor. I taught every format under the sun. And then I started getting into personal training. And then I was like, you know what? I really don't, really don't want to do all this anymore. I want to manage. And in trying to find a managerial position, I found myself applying for this kettlebell studio. And I remember the person interviewing me was like, oh, you've used kettlebells before? Strong First or RKC? And I was like, both. And he but was like, had you oh. never, you'd never done it before? 
So what was your background? So going to school for musical theater, I'm guessing you had dance classes. Did you grow up dancing? Like, what did you grow up doing? Like, what was your physical background? I guess I'm asking. Great question. I was definitely a mover, a mover with attitude. Right. Um, (laughs) But um, so when I, when I was growing up, I took dance classes, but I was always the girl who was a little bit um, overweight. And my dance teachers always made sure to let me know that I had a nickname of being called the elephant by my one jazz teacher. And when I was in the sixth grade, my best friend pulled me aside one day and she was like, Colleen, I think everybody would like you a lot better if you were skinnier. And then she, she showed me how to make myself throw up. So I ended up struggling with bulimia for about 10 years and you know, that's definitely a hard thing to do while trying to manage musical theater as it relates to our our vocal cords, right? I spent time in dance classes, but I was definitely never the star of the room. I tried some different sports growing up, but a lot of times sports would conflict with musicals that would be going on. I was never very athletic. So even if I was on a team, I would be the kid who would be sitting on the bench. And I really didn't feel like I was an athlete until I found kettlebells. You know, I spent a lot of time working out as it relates to being on pieces of cardio equipment. I remember when this whole incident initially happened in the sixth grade, I used to wake up around 4 a.m. to work out for a couple of hours so that the cardio equipment would say burned at least a thousand calories. So I felt like I was allowed to eat something at school for the day. So that was pretty much my life up until... I was 17. When I was 17, I ended up having three abdominal surgeries back to back within a month and a half of each other. And I don't know about you guys, but having abdominal surgery and then trying to sing, like it takes time to be able to, yeah, to, to breathe again, to get a long note out again. So it was, um, it was a really rough road until I, initially got in the fitness industry, starting with indoor cycling. And it just felt kind of like I was on this hamster wheel. I'm trying to become healthy. I'm trying to become this fitness professional, this example for other women. And it almost felt like there was a bit of a facade going on because I'd be doing these classes. I'd be, you know, preaching these messages, but in the background, I'm just like counting my calories. I'm being super, you know, conservative with what I'm allowing myself to eat. It felt rigid, like, rigid and, mm-hmm. and restrictive. Yes. Yeah. Rigid and restricted. And it wasn't until I found the kettlebells that my life totally changed. And right around the time I found the kettlebells, I had gotten engaged and my husband is the greatest man in the world. Um, I don't have a good relationship with his family whatsoever. And during this time we ended up having our wedding canceled three times before it actually happened. And this was the first time that I was kind of just like, fuck it. You know what? I'm going to eat the pizza. I'm going to drink the beer. I'm going to have the chocolate. Like I, I can't stress out about being skinny. I just, I can't, I can't do it. And I start managing this kettlebell studio and a couple of the trainers start like watching me. And I'm just like, why are they watching me? Why do these people care so much about me? I'm managing them. And the one pulls me aside one day and he's like, we all know you have no idea what you're doing with a kettlebell. Oh no. Oh no. And I was like, oh my gosh, how do they know? But they knew. Um, it's one of those things with kettlebells. Y- you don't know what you don't know, but everybody who knows what you don't know, they can tell you have no idea what you're doing. Well, and, there's a technique. I'm, I yeah, don't know exactly. anything about it besides what I've seen. I mean, a lot of what I've seen from you on Instagram recently, but I'm assuming there is a very proper technique, much like when you go into a ballet studio, you can't fake that. Like you have the technique or you don't. So I can see who knows what they're doing is spotting this. I wouldn't have any freaking idea, but. But exactly. You know, that's, it's a really great way to kind of think of it. Like Within kettlebells, it's like dance, there's ballet, there's jazz, there's tap. Within kettlebells, there's kettlebell sport, there's hard style, there's the people who juggle, there's people who just use a kettlebell the same way you would a dumbbell. It's like this whole little secret world that most people don't know anything about until you decide that you want to invest and learn what is this all about. But in learning what it was about, I started to learn the technique and my body started changing without me changing anything to my diet. 
I got really, really strong. And it was the first time that I felt like, oh, wow, I'm, I'm capable of doing some hard things. And was this just with a single kettlebell? Like that's all you're doing. You're not doing cardio. You're not running. You're not doing anything. It's, it's, you're just swinging a kettlebell. I'm just swinging a kettlebell. I I don't mean to diminish it to something so basic, but it's, I mean, you know, the other thing that's interesting is, um, you know, anybody can swing a kettlebell much the way, you know, anyone can cook, cook an egg. Right. But in order to cook like the best egg, the pan needs to be heated to a specific degree. You want butter in the pan, not olive oil, not Pam, not like any fake shit. You want the butter, right? It's very specific. And that's kind of the way the swing can transform your life. Can you break it down for us? So like, we're not talking about lifting weights here. We're talking about swinging a kettlebell. And for someone who has not seen that, can you break down just with your words, what that actually entails? And I see, I see a video, you use your whole body, but can you kind of break it down for us? Totally. Basically what's happening is we need to go from, you know, Pac-Man, you know, Mm -hmm. Pac-Man's mouth. Can we see Mm -hmm. that? It's kind of like this Mm -hmm. triangular shape. So our body is creating that shape. Our shoulders are higher than our hips. Our hips are higher than our knees. Our knees are in line, if not slightly behind the balls of our feet. Mm -hmm. So our body is basically making Pac-Man's mouth. So we need to go from that position to a standing plank. So if I'm in a plank position, I have my shoulders stacked on top of my wrists, my whole body's in one straight line. So I'm going from Pac-Man's mouth to this standing plank. And I need to do this really, really quickly. That's one of the interesting things about kettlebells. Uh, A lot of people think I'm going to hurt myself and you can totally hurt yourself if you don't have the right breath, if you don't have the right amount of tension. But when you have the right amount of breath, the right amount of tension, and you're hiking that bell quickly in between your legs and standing up as fast as you can, the bell just floats. And it's almost like a piece of artwork. You're just up, there's this beautiful pause, the bell drops, and then you recreate Pac-Man's mouth. And we just do that on repeat again and again and again. And it's, it's very therapeutic. That's how I would describe it. That's how a lot of my female clients would describe it. It's almost like being rocked in a rocking chair. There's just something soothing about it. I've done a little bit of kettlebell training, um, throughout my time and yeah, I really, I love watching people do it. I find it very soothing. The it, like professionals like that know what they're doing. It's just very soothing to watch the rhythm. And then once you get it, it's more like, I think in your mind, if you don't know anything about it and you're watching it, you think it's all in your arms and your upper body, but it's all in your, in your lower body and your legs and your glutes. And it's really a beautiful thing. And I love the yeah. fact that you mentioned that the arm component, I mean, when it comes to kettlebells doing the majority of these lower body exercises, and we'll keep talking about the swing. All of the power is coming from your lower body. Your arms are just guiding it into place. And that's something that I think a lot of people miss out on when they, you know, go to the university of YouTube, or they just try and learn off the videos that they see from a professional on Instagram, which there's nothing wrong with that. However, you surprise yourself with how far you can go when you hire that professional and you learn the things that you wouldn't know, because why would anybody know anything about throwing a iron ball around? The, the hard style kettlebell technique is what really changed your life, right? Yes. And that's what I practice. And that's what I train women in specifically. What is that? How is it different than the other styles? Hard style kettlebell technique is all about understanding how to create the right amount of tension and proper breath technique to lift very heavy weight or very heavy relative weight safely and efficiently for low reps. So typically if I'm in a training session with clients, we're probably not doing more than like five to eight reps at a time. But then if you go into something like kettlebell sport, and this is a lot of the other stuff that you'll see. So if if you're scrolling on Instagram, you'll see people who are very rigid and that's hard style. And then you'll see other people who are like kind of loose and that's kettlebell sport. So that type of kettlebell training is all about endurance. So they'll hold on to the kettlebell up to 10 minutes before they set it down. And their weight's typically not as heavy. With hard style, I mean, I'm getting women all different weights, but let's range it out between like 110 to 
like 180 pounds throwing very heavy weight around anything starting as light as 25 pounds to 95 pounds in one hand at a time. Wow. Whoa. 95 pounds in one hand at a time sounds yes. unbelievable. Yeah, so it does. Crazy. I came from a background of, I did grow up dancing and I am tall and I'm bigger boned. I'm more broad. And I grew up thinking, oh my God, don't lift weights. It will make your body tight bulky. Also, I was told by one of my dance teachers, don't do spinning. It's going to make your legs bulky, like Pilates, use your own body weight only. And I now know that's not the case. Women really should be lifting weights, but it's only in the past, I would say five years that I've incorporated lifting weights into my routine and now, and learning about how important it is. Can you as an expert talk to, speak to women who might still be afraid of getting too bulky and also tell us why it's so important to build muscle? Absolutely. This is like a whole loaded question right here, but I think it's really important for women to understand first and foremost, we don't make enough testosterone in order to actually bulk up. If you actually want to put on like a bunch of muscle, a bunch, a bunch of muscle, it, it's hard. It is so hard. You have to eat a tremendous amount of calories. You have to put in a, you need to be doing more than that hour or 45 minute or 30 minute workout in order to really put a dent in your body. I think a lot of times, you know, when women start strength training, they're like, I don't know. I feel like I'm getting bigger. They're probably just like eating too much. That's kind of my take on that. It's not the weights. It really isn't. It's not possible for us to turn into a physique that you would see a man or women who are in these figure competitions. We can't just do that easily. Have you ever watched the behind the scenes videos of the Wonder Woman training videos? Do you remember in that movie, they all had these like gun, like these arms and they were trained, they were training to build those muscles like seven hours a day. They it's increased their job. calories by like four times as much oh as they God. were eating. Like it was a full time job. So exactly to your point, you're not going to get that by incorporating five pound weights into your 30 minute routine. But I'll tell you what you will get. If you can do that, if you can do what Alex just said three times a week, you are going to increase muscle mass. That doesn't mean I'm going to get bulky. Mm -hmm. That's going to mean I'm going to be able to burn a lot more calories at rest. So I don't have to work out as much. I can eat a little bit more and I'm going to drop body fat. And I think that's something that a lot of, a lot of times when I run into clients who are looking to lose weight, it's not so much about the number. It's about, I want to, I want to look different. I want to fit differently into these clothes. And, you know, I think sometimes for some people, it is about that number, especially being somebody who's recovered from an eating disorder. I understand how that number on the scale, it really can mess with your mind. However, I think for a lot of people, it's, I, I just want to feel really good and I want to feel really confident. And I, I'd like to have some more muscle and decrease my body fat and that's it. And strength training will do that. So beyond the the physical changes that you can feel, what are the mental benefits? I mean, you, you've I've, in doing research about you, you've spoken about overcoming um, your eating disorder and uh, about uh, sexual trauma, healing te sexual trauma through um, kettlebell. How how does that even begin to work? Because I wouldn't even think to put the two things together. I'll tell you, it was something that I had no idea made any sense together. So over the past year, I've had a few clients confide in me that they are survivors of sexual or physical assault. And I have a client who is a psychologist. My coach, my personal kettlebell coach also has education in psychology. And then there's another coach that I'm friends with and she's noticed over the past several years of her training, how specific kettlebell exercises have a very specific outcome on her clients. And due to the pandemic, it's been really easy for me to connect with more women than ever before. And what I've noticed is that there's certain exercises, the swing and the Turkish getup are really great examples that can help to re-energize certain chakras. So we have seven chakras in our body. So if we have somebody who's a survivor of, let's say a sexual assault, there's probably some like lower energy 
that's firing up around like the sacral chakra, mm -hmm. right? Or in the heart chakra. So when we're doing an exercise like the kettlebell swing, there's this continuous movement pattern of, I hate to say thrusting because a swing is technically not a thrust. However, there's this continuous pattern of hips forward, hips forward, hips forward, hips forward. And it helps to re-energize that chakra specifically. And the same thing kind of goes with the heart chakra with all these different patterns. With kettlebells, we have to keep our chest open. Our lats are engaged, our shoulders are down, our shoulders are back. And when we're doing these different patterns, it's helping to open up that chakra. And the combination of those two things is really helpful for people to get these energy spindles working again after they've been shut off. That and the combination of just feeling like really fucking strong is very empowering, especially if you have gone through something like that, which I've had these women confine in me that, oh my gosh, I feel like myself again. I feel like I'm back in my body. I had this one female client who had a very horrific story. And when we first started training with kettlebells, I remember thinking to myself, like this woman, like she's not, she's not going to last. She's going to be with me for like a week, two weeks. And then she's going to be out the door. Cause when it comes to kettlebell training, the devil's in the detail. There's so many things you have to think about between I need tension in my lats. I need tension in my core. I need tension in my legs. I need tension in my feet. I need the right breath to happen at the right moment in time. And then I have to think about like what I'm actually doing with this exercise. And this woman, she could not keep her feet glued to the floor. Her toes would just like be flying all over the place. I would tell her bits and pieces of things that she needed to tighten up. And it seemed like it was going in one ear and out the other, but she stayed with me and she stayed with me during my, my 13 week kettlebell intensive called swing to snatch. And when we got to the end of the course, she told me that she was a survivor of this horrific incident. And she was like, she was like, I've, I finally feel like I'm healing. And I finally feel like I'm back in my body. And what she's expressed is from her experience, she's just disassociated from being in her body. But with kettlebells, you're forced to be in your body because if you're not, you're going to get hurt. So she would have to be present. She'd have to feel for that tension. She'd have to think about every single one of her toes being on the floor while getting the right breath out, while having the right timing happen. And I think it's one of those things that was incredible for her because she was forced to be present. That makes so much sense to me because when you walk on the treadmill, when you're on an elliptical, when you're sitting on a bike, you can be on your phone, you can be talking, you know, you can be scrolling, you can be talking on the phone, you can be like listening to a podcast, but to do anything that takes real skill or technique, you have to be so present or exactly something bad's going to happen. And also there is a lot of research that women store a ton of tension and just old trauma in their bodies, even more so than men. And I remember... I'd always done yoga. I remember when I moved to New York, I started doing hot yoga. And my hot yoga teacher said, you know, sometimes women cry or get really emotional doing pigeon pose because women hold a lot of tension in their hips. So, you know, just don't be alarmed. And I was like, okay, like woo woo, you, you know, whatever. And then I remember it happened to me one day being in pigeon and like something released from me. So this makes so much sense to me. I'm just, I'm so happy for your clients. Yeah. Well, in, in therapy, a lot of times if I'm like having a lot of, I don't know, anger or energy that I can't, that feels stuck or I can't move, my therapist is always like, get up and move, like hit something, go for a run, like just move your body to get the energy because it can get stagnant. So like everything you were saying was just like, oh my God, yes, that makes total sense. And it's, it's not at all to say that this is a replacement for, you know, going to therapy or doing other things to, right. to help heal, but it's to point out that this is something that could help over, you know, choosing a cycling class where you're all covered and hunched. Something like this could be potentially be a little bit more helpful for you on your healing journey. I also think there's something psychologically about building upper body strength for women since we're naturally born with just a little bit less than men. Do you know what I mean? Like, I don't yeah. know a lot of women who have genetically like huge muscly arms. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. well, we carry so much of our weight down, in, yes, exactly. down in our hips. So I think being able to lift something heavy or, you know what I mean, is yeah. psychologically 
really good for women. Switching gears, fun fact, you are a Guinness Guinness Book of World Records holder. Can you tell us about that? That's so cool. Thank you so much. Yes, Um, congratulations. Thank you. Um, So back in early 2021, I decided I wanted to set a world record and I like you do like every woman does well you know what I didn't I didn't grow up as an athlete and so before the whole pandemic hit I was running around to multiple studios either personal training or teaching classes or doing doing whatever I was doing and it was really hard for me to prioritize my own training just because I was so much on the run So when the pandemic hit, I really had an opportunity where I could be like, hey, coach, like, let's pick something big and let's go after it. We decided we were going to go after a a world record. So I set the world record for heaviest weight lifted by female via Turkish getup in July. And you know when they say you need to read the fine print? I didn't read the fine print. Oh, no. What does that mean? (laughs) So a Turkish getup. All right. This is going to be a little bit harder to explain versus the swing, but you start laying down on your back and your goal is to stand up. I just with watched a- you do a video okay. of this. I'm, I'll post about it. I'll post it. Fantastic. So when, when you're taught to do a hard style Turkish get, so within the kettlebell world, within hard style, there's two extremely well known certification courses to go through. So there is RKC and there is strong first. And the way that both of those certifications teach people to do a Turkish getup is pressing it over your head with two hands. So if you see any of the videos on my page, other than anything referencing the world record, you'll notice anytime I get the kettlebell into position, I use two hands and then I put my hand down on the side and I use one arm to bring it up. So I didn't find out until a couple days before my attempt that I could only use one arm to press it up and then bring it back down, which might not sound that hard. It was a total game changer. I wasn't training any type of press patterns up until that point. So um, my whole strategy went out the window. And after that attempt, I logged all my information. I got everything sent over to Guinness and I put in a new application to beat the record. Cause I was like, no. Like this was, this was clearly not my best shame on me. I'm going to do it again and I'm going to beat it. And I beat it by over 900 kilo. Wow. Which was awesome. That's so cool. Incredible. So wait, so you send an application. Is this something that like somebody has to come out and like verify that it's you and like, or do you go somewhere to do, how, how does it it work? work? Oh my gosh, you guys should totally set a Guinness world record. Okay. Or break one. <laughs> Let's do it. You should totally do it. Um, so the process is annoying in the sense that it just like takes so much time. I'm assuming there's a lot of applications that they get or they have a really small department. I don't know what the answer is, but you submit an application. It takes about three months before you get clearance that yes, you you can do this. And for me, when I was initially setting the record, they gave me like a minimum number that I had to hit. So I do my record and everything's getting filmed. So if you go on my page, you'll see like a video camera from straight on and a video camera from the side in some of the clips. And that's to verify what's happening. Like you can't, you can't cheat it. You need Mm -hmm. to have a clock in the frame. You need to have witnesses involved. You can bring somebody out. It's extra money. It's like a thousand dollars to bring somebody out to like clear it. So I had my stuff recorded. I had my witnesses, and then you submit the information and then they tell you, you either did it or somebody beat you or that's, that's it. I want to ask you how you define success in your life right now, because you went from being in a business of theater, arts, entertainment, which is crazy subjective. Tina and I know this more than anyone. Someone will watch a perform your performance. Someone will think it's trash. The other person will think it's a treasure and it's amazing. Super subjective. Kettlebells, you can do it or you can't, you know? So how are you defining success right now? I think it depends um, what relationship we're looking at. So right now, I think success for me is continuing to inspire other women to realize we're all fucking limitless. 
And that's one of the big things that came from doing this record is I, I did not grow up as the athlete. I ended up having three abdominal surgeries. Fun fact, it's kettlebells that allowed me to start feeling my lower abdominals again. Wow. Okay. Wait, can I ask you, can I detour a little bit? What happened? What, what, what were these it? surgeries? Yeah. Um, I had my appendix taken out and then they saw this abnormally large ovarian cyst. So we take those out in one operation. And then two weeks later, there's this abscess and they think I'm going to die. So they take that out. And then three weeks later, they go back in and they remove one of my ovaries and one of my fallopian tubes. It was oh crazy, gosh. but I couldn't feel my lower abs for like years. Like you Whoa. could like scratch my stomach and I had no sensation at all. Imagine it's like recovering. Oh. From, it's what I hear women say recovering from a C-section, but worse because you had three in a row. So before I had these surgeries, you know, I was waking up at 4 a.m. I was on pieces of cardio equipment and I was also like the crunch queen, like to the point of being like OCD about it. Like I would drop down in the middle of class to do like a set of 10 crunches. I was crazy. After these operations, I started feeling my low back during crunches. I started feeling my neck during crunches. So like everything that I was so used to doing, I couldn't do. And then this like always felt super embarrassing. I would you know, I was teaching all these group fitness classes and I would go to take other people's classes, especially in the beginning, you know, you're, you're learning, you're trying to be mentored by other people. And I remember feeling so bad about myself because there would always be like an ab section at the end of somebody's class and I couldn't do it. And I would be called out and I'd be called out as like the instruct, like one of our instructors, like Colleen, like get it together. But I, I would literally just like be in pain. And one of the things that I love so much about the kettlebells is you're working your core in so many different ways without ever having to do a goddamn crunch. And now you have your own kettlebell business, a virtual online business, right? Yes. So tell us about that. What is that like? It's the most incredible thing in the world. That's why I'm able to live in Arizona. So up until the pandemic, so that year going into the pandemic, I was working Monday through, I was working Sunday through Friday. I would get on the train around 4 a.m. and I'd get home around like 8 p.m. And I was working for Equinox and I would travel between like at least five to six locations within a day, see private clients in their gyms. I was shooting for an app at the time and life was just crazy. And I remember I, remember I didn't go to work one day because I was like, I just need a break. And the next day, um, the gym's closed. And I was like, oh my Whoa. gosh, this is crazy. And I remember just thinking to myself and talking to my husband, who's also in fitness, you know, I, I don't want this to be my life. Like, I don't want to be 35, 45, 55 on this track. This, this can't be my life. I'm so grateful right now, but like, what's going to happen? And when the pandemic hit, I started doing like, Zoom classes, but it was like crazy. I was doing like a yoga class, a hit class. I had a kettlebell class. I was teaching cycling classes from my bathroom. I had my bike all set up. Whoa. And then I was like, I'm probably going to be here for a while. And I saw this girl who was advertising business coaching and it was a $5,000 investment at the time. And I was like, at the time I was making like $20,000 for the year. I was like, I don't know if I can actually do this, but it feels like I have to do something because I, I don't, I don't know what the other option is. And I invested and I created a 13 week intensive. And in the midst of creating this intensive, I spent a lot of time on social media and I just started attracting these women that wanted to learn how to use kettlebells. And in my first launch, I ended up making $24,000. And I was just like, Whoa, Whoa, like, what is this? My life has changed because of it. I I was able to leave my small apartment in the suburbs of New Jersey to move out to Arizona. Uh, me and my husband are buying a house that we're moving into next month. And I work from home. I get to see my husband. I get to go out with new people that I've met in Arizona, but I still get to service my clients and I get to service all the clients that I want. Like, before the pandemic, my private clients were like a lot of old men and like a lot of old men that just like mm -hmm. wanted the cute female trainer yeah. in their building. But yeah. I felt like, what am I doing? 
Yeah, it like, didn't feel good. It didn't feel good. But now, like, I mean, I have this, like, lovely photo of a bunch of Aww. my female clients. And it's just, like, the most wonderful thing in the world to see that I'm actually making a difference for people that I can relate to. And, you know, I understand a lot of the struggles that they go through um, because I've been there myself. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned in myself is, no, Colleen, like you, you aren't limited. You can, you can do whatever you want. You just need the right game plan set in place. You need the right people to ask help of when you need help and you need to be consistent and things are going to move forward. And honestly, like that's, I think that's one of the things that I love so much about the kettlebells. You know, one of you had said this before, musical theater is very subjective, but kettlebells, it's very objective. Either you can do it or you can't. And that's something that I, I love about this because I know if I can't do it, I'll find a way to learn how to. Exactly. It's not opinion-based. And I can see that being very refreshing coming from an opinion-based business. Okay. And I want to go back to ask you that question, which is by defining success and by success, I mean, happy, healthy life. So can you talk about how that definition for you has changed? So let's say musical theater, college days, how did you define it then? And how do you define it? Successful, strong kettlebell specialist business owner now? Musical theater days, I would have described it as getting the lead role. And now I think to, to an extent, success comes with getting to share with other women. Like I, I love, I love hitting something new for myself to inspire my clients. I love seeing my clients hit PRs because I see how awesome it makes them feel. And I love the fact that so many of them are, are like down to show stuff on social. I had, I had eight of them come out here this past October to have like a little kettlebell retreat dash competition. And it's crazy because like all of these women live all over the world and we came together over kettlebells and like they pump each other up because they see one another swinging that sucker. And I think a lot of the success that I feel right now and the way I define it is being able to share wins with other women. We feel the same. We feel the same the way. So yes. If a woman, if there's a woman listening who wants to venture into weight training, whether it's kettlebell with you or if it's someone, someone else and it's new to them and they're nervous, what would you say? You need to hire a coach and you know, you really do not need to be in person with coaches at this point. I actually think it's a lot easier to teach people how to use kettlebells virtually than in person. And I'm a really big fan of that because if I have you on my screen, I can easily take out my phone, videotape you, and then we can easily watch it back at the same angle every single time. So it's a lot easier for me to get feedback than it is to give feedback to people in person. That's interesting. Great. I don't know if everybody else feels that way, but I feel really good about doing it virtually. But what I would say is you, you need a coach and you can go hire whoever you want. Like that's the beauty of being virtual. Like you're not stuck to the gym down the corner. There's so many people out on social right now who are trying to help. And there's a lot of people who are really, they're really good. So if you are looking for someone to get connected with, you're more than welcome to slide into my DMs and I'm more than happy to help guide you to the perfect person for you. So you responded, yes. I sent a DM, you responded in like two seconds. So yes. send Colleen a DM if you want to get going with her. Okay, before yes. we let you go, we have just some really fun, fun rapid fire questions we want to ask. Okay. What are you reading or what are you watching right now? I just finished Safe. Yes, that's TV show on Netflix, right? TV show on Netflix. I keep telling people it's the guy who is Dexter. Yes, it's Michael yes. C. Hall. Yeah, Thank yeah, yeah. You. How Thank is it? You. I keep I keep seeing it on my Netflix. It's great. Yeah, it is great. I would recommend it to anybody who likes a little a little crime drama. If you're drinking, what are you having? Dirty martini, extra oh, olives, same. blue cheese stuffed olives. What is the best advice you've ever received? Create it and they will come. I live by that so much. Mm -hmm. It's just that mm -hmm. leap of faith. Sometimes you just gotta do it and see what happens. So is there a woman who is currently inspiring you? I'm inspired by a lot of different women all the time, but I will say this. I don't know if this is cocky. I'm pretty inspired by myself right now. That's Fantastic. a great answer. Fantastic. Colleen, where can we find you? Find me on IG 
I am Colleen Conlon or go to my website, www.colleenconlon.com. Colleen, thank you so much for being here with us. We had a ball. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.